So, um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is um, yeah, a quick visit in the world of uh, real time and uh, why I think it impo it's important and uh, how it can change the way you build your apps. So, uh, I'm glad to be here today. Yeah, you don't hear me? Not so bad. Um, to tell you more about uh, real time apps, I've been working on building real time apps for uh, the last few years. Uh, different startups, and I think um, today almost every app could benefit uh, from real time. Uh, it used to be complicated and hard, I think, uh, hard to scale as well. Uh, but now, with uh, a few different uh, ways to do it, it's become, I think, simple and scalable. So I'd like to start with uh, why I think it's important and uh, how uh, it uh, really benefits to the users. So the user world, you know, today, uh, it's changing quickly. Uh, you have a lot of information, data. Uh, you need to react quickly. Uh, it's not just uh, for tech. Um, and many people are working as teams and collaborating all the time. Also, we have uh, mobile, who, which has changed a lot of things. And it has definitely changed uh, the expectations of, uh, of the users. You also have the Internet of Things, which is coming, uh, which offers new opportunities and new ways to connect things together and to interact in real time. And you have this kind of um, addiction, you know, people are like on uh, Twitter uh, scrolling down to get the latest updates uh, and you always want more and, uh, and quicker. So it's about the daily uh, struggle of the user, you know. Uh, the web has a lot evolved. First we had uh, static HTML pages, then we got JavaScript, we got Ajax. Uh, then we moved to single page apps to make it uh, quicker and better. Um, and the way I, I feel it is the next evolution of this is really to making it uh, real time. Because you have the single page app, which makes it uh, instant to react um, to the user actions. But then you are waiting for the data, which is only updating uh, when people ask for it. Or at, at least at some regular interval. So what I want to get rid of uh, is really this, you know as a pull to refresh. Um, we wait for people triggers, um, and also we have refresh buttons, uh, sign up forms with different steps, and you wait until people uh, click on some button to complete and move to the next one and so on. Um, so I think we can do better. And so today for me is a time of fast and real time. As I said, mobile apps have really raised expectations, and single page apps are kind of the web side of this, and it helps provide a closer uh, experience to uh, mobile apps. And what people expect as well uh, with mobile is uh, push notifications. So they are no longer waiting for uh, their email updating every five minutes or 10 minutes. They are waiting to get the updates um, just directly when it's uh, available. So there's another side of this, which is uh, cross-device syncing, and uh, so multi-device, multi-platform sync. Uh, for instance, Apple brought it to uh, the latest OS X uh, with continuity to kind of help smooth um, uh, when you go from one device to the other. But then again, it really um, asks you to be able to have the data shared in real time between devices. And then you also have collaboration platforms like uh, Google Docs, uh, Slack, um, which really shows that people are collaborating together on this. So the big question is, when do you need real time? Is it for everything? Is it just for uh, specific things? Um, to me, it's clear that the benefits are really clear. Uh, you have an increased user engagement. So as I've seen that on many different sites. Uh, you also increase the user experience and the quality of the user flow. Um, some other benefits are maybe a bit different. It depends on the cases, but it can help decrease the server load as you keep connected. And there are many, many different use cases. Um, the obvious one, I think, is uh, instant messaging and group chat. You always have, you always have also um, collaboration and content. Um, it's a, exactly the, the Google Docs things, uh, but how can you bring that to your own applications? Like when people are working on some form and preparing to submit it, what happens if several people are doing it at the same time? Um, with real time, you could be um, instead of using one text area, uh, using some collaborative text area where several people can be at this step already collaborating together. But there are also different things like real-time monitoring services. For instance, um, recently I worked on a, creating a worker for some tasks, um, and I didn't want to have to uh, wait for the end 
uh, to be able to show some um, some results to the user. And with basic um, real-time features, I was able to uh, really quickly provide um, updates in real time to the user to about what's happening, what's the current state, uh, where is it headed, and so on. And then you have a lot of different things like live charting and graphing, real-time web analytics, uh, digital advertising, e-commerce, publishing, all this could benefit from real-time uh, some way or the other. Now, it's a bit different because uh, you already have features, so uh, you're not going to change everything you already have, and that's not what I'm uh, trying to say. Um, for existing features, I think for some of these, you can make it real-time quite easily. You don't have to change the whole architecture of what you do. Uh, there are simple, simple ways to move in that direction through a notifications layer uh, with channels or streams, and you can just subscribe to know when um, some new data is available, and then you just call your uh, existing refresh method. So it's just a way to be notified of the, uh, of the existing new data. Uh, so this is similar to push notifications. You just know there is new data, you don't get it, but you can react. Uh, I think it's super, it's super useful with third party also, like um, when you use some connect with something, uh, like uh, GitHub or Facebook, uh, to automatically update the whole uh, single page application uh, in real time as soon as the user is connected. Uh, you know, you open this pop-up, it starts uh, the process and so on. And once it's done, uh, as your app is listening for, um, for instance, the status of uh, a, is the user connected to this service, as soon as it's connected, you can update your whole UI without reloading the page or things like this. For new features, um, you can conceive it with real time in mind, I think, um, and we'll get back to that later. Um, so next time you'll be able to, you'll, you'll be asked to develop like things like chat, IM, notifications, uh, status. Uh, I think think about it twice. Who has been already uh, in the room asked to be, to develop some real time uh, feature? Yeah, so quite many people. Yeah. So the question is um, for me: uh, Where would you like to go? Um, it's clear for me. It's uh, real time first. Uh, and I think it echoes to uh, a few things we've heard for the last, uh, for the last couple of days uh, about uh, offline first, because uh, I'll get back to that, but I think it's really the same direction. And if your architecture is real-time first, uh, it's also uh, offline first and vice versa. Um, also, what we heard about streams, uh, I think, makes a lot of sense, and it really uh, matches uh, this approach. Now, the question is, uh, how do you do it and uh, how to get it uh, to scale so th you, you have two big ways, and you, you have a choice to make here, uh, between uh, self-hosted and uh, hosted platforms. Uh, it's definitely not the same. Self-hosted may be a requirement. Someone told it the other day, but uh, I know in some countries or for some projects, um, it may be a requirement to, to have the thing working on a dedicated server and so on. So you may not have the choice. Um, and also hosted as a price, but it also offers uh, many trade-offs. So regarding uh, self-hosted, uh, I think on the, on the plus side, you have direct access to the database. Uh, you can customize it, really makes it, uh, make it fit your needs. Uh, the, um, the cons are, do you really want to maintain that? Um, how do you get it to scale? Because it's not easy. Uh, I think if I ask you, how, how can you make a new uh, real-time feature, you'd think about uh, Node.js with uh, Socket.io or something like that. But for people who've already, already tried, um, socket IO is not um, super simple uh, to get to uh, large scale applications. But that's still one, one way of doing it. And um, I don't know if you follow it, but uh, socket IO now automatically takes care of WebSocket and also long polling uh, built in. So it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite convenient and um, it really works uh, with many browsers in many different situations. You also have s some other um, approach like uh, Meteor.js, which can be both hosted or self-hosted. Um, and you also can use a hoodie. I uh, know you, you know more about that. But what I'm going to focus, I think, more about uh, is uh, hosted. Um, and, and I've been using it. Um, and I think it's, it can be very powerful. It scales. It's simple, usually. Uh, you have support. Uh, you also have a lot of uh, features. And in addition, what, what is complicated when you use some uh, self-hosted system here, it's usually not multi-platform. You have one thing for the web, um, using Socket.io, for instance, or things similar.
but then you don't get uh, all the APIs and SDKs for a different um, for iOS or Android, for instance. So you're not independent. Um, in some cases, uh, like I'm, I'm, I'm going to point later on, you don't have uh, direct access to uh, the raw database, uh, and, and it, it also has a price. You have kind of three categories here. Um, you have, as I said, uh, general messaging, uh, pub sub uh, approach, uh, which are mainly uh, channels. Um, it doesn't take care of uh, data, of uh, persistence of the data, so it's easily it's it's maybe easier to integrate in existing projects, uh, but it's limited. It's not going to completely change uh, the way you build your app, which which may be good. Then you have um, all the kind of things uh, which take care of data, data sync, uh, persistence, uh, which are kind of full stack uh, real time uh, frameworks. You have Firebase, uh, which is um, the, the provider I'm going to focus on uh, later on. But you also have you also have the Google Drive real time API. Um, you have Meteor again. And then you have also different things you can try uh, on messaging, which, which are very limited in my opinion. So you have uh, various challenges here. Um, we've been talking a lot about our, um, single page apps, uh, but it's, it may not be uh, obvious, but not everyone uh, already has a, a single page app today. Uh, for, for real time, uh, you know, the WebSocket is not a persistent when you change your page. So Obviously, you need first um, to go to a single page app uh, to really benefit from real time. Otherwise, when you change the page, uh, it has to reconnect and so on, and, and you're losing most of it. Then there are the questions around um, da data binding, um, and this is a bit tricky. Uh, it can get complicated. Then it kind of merged um, the front end of the back end worlds, um, and developers have to get interested in the way uh, data is stored, uh, especially when you use some f full stack persistent uh, system. So you, you really need to get interested in uh, best practices on uh, how you denormalize your data. Uh, it's no longer um, the responsibility of uh, the backend team or um, database engineers. Uh, it, it becomes really um, a matter uh, for everyone. And then again, you don't have necessarily uh, a direct access to database, uh, so migra migrations uh, can become a bit tricky. So, as I said, I'm going to focus on uh, on uh, on Firebase, um, and and why Firebase and and Backbone together. As a quick uh, comparison here, um, just I want to show uh, kind of obviously. Uh, the different things you have uh, as, a, as an option when you've chosen to use Firebase. Um, they've been really um, pushing integrations with everything, so that's a, that's a good thing. Whatever you like, uh, even if it's uh, Ember or React, you, you have integration with um, all of this because Firebase has been working on it. But basically, I think the Firebase API I'm going to show um, a bit later on um, is really simple. And it has a very similar approach uh, to, um, to to Backbone. Um, keep it as simple as you can. Also, it it works well with uh, model and collections. And I think the um, the back the Backbone um, limits the, f the fact that uh, your collection has models and models have uh, flat properties. And it doesn't really work so well if you try to have um, arrays as properties and so on. Um, it helps to structure your data correctly, so it's a good thing. And in addition, uh, what, we, what we'll see in a second is the transition uh, is, in fact, pretty easy. But you just get uh, a two-way data binding, binding uh, which is good. Uh, but when you, when you get to compare with uh, uh, Angular, for very simple projects, Angular may seem uh, easier to... Uh, um, have directly some amazing wow effect. Uh, with Angular, you have this kind of uh, black magic. When you bind with Firebase, uh, you build something. Um, the user starts uh, changing the input, and it's automatically um, it's automatically saved uh, and replicated to the other clients. So it's very um, it's very efficient. 
you have this choice between um, representing the collection as an object or as an array, because uh, in Firebase, uh, everything has um, a unique key. And uh, you have a community around uh, Angular and Firebase together, uh, which is very active. Um, and I think um, this is maybe the opportunity to get uh, people using a uh, backbone uh, very interested in, um, in Firebase and showing how it can really help uh, to build better apps. So Firebase and Backbone Fire, uh, it used to be called Backfire. I'm just saying this because when, when you search for it on Google, uh, it, it may be uh, a bit tricky. It used to be called Backfire, but now they, they call it Backbone Fire. It's on GitHub. So a bit more, uh, a bit more context about, uh, about Firebase. So Firebase is a backend as a service. Uh, so it's, uh, it's hosted and it takes care of uh, data persistence. What it basically means, uh, I think, to, to all of you is, um, oh, just a quick question, who is mainly a um, client-side uh, JavaScript developer and doesn't work on, uh, on backend here? Okay, so I think Firebase is really a unique opportunity for, uh, for you because what it means is you no longer need a, ba a backend. You, don't, you, you no longer need someone to write uh, the API uh, to take care of setting up a database and uh, uh, making the, the, the API work with the database and so on. You just, you're responsible for everything. Um, you just take this uh, JavaScript into your, um, into your app and you get started. You have uh, persistence, you have real time, you have full REST API at the same time. So it's very powerful. And you also get um, very powerful security. Uh, what Firebase has, it's uh, security rules. Uh, it's just, in fact, a big a JSON object where you could describe uh, who can access what, uh, what, is, uh, uh, what are read and write uh, rights. Um, and it can be very, very uh, well um, uh, developed with uh, uh, complex uh, rules uh, based on the new data arriving, uh, based on the existing data, uh, based on uh, existing data at l different locations uh, in, uh, in, your, in your existing database. So you can really create something entirely secure and in the same time it's uniquely a client side. You don't have a server, uh, and that's it. Also, they provide, but it's a side uh, plugin, so you don't uh, take it all at once, but they provide a side, uh, sign up and login providers. Uh, so you just with few uh, add ons, you can have Facebook, Google, GitHub, and so on um, connect, uh, integrated, and they take care of uh, signing up, uh, sending emails, and so on. One big thing I think, uh, and what I said earlier, is uh, multi-platform. They've really created uh, an environment here, which remains simple. The API is exactly the same everywhere, and you get uh, JavaScript, Node, uh, iOS, Android, plus a full REST API with streaming. So it means if you're, uh, for instance, if you're a fan of uh, Go, uh, you, you can also use it with Go and, and the REST streaming API uh, provide you with um, the data in real time uh, with standard web things. You don't, uh, there's no, there's nothing really um, um, hidden here. Even the JavaScript, uh, the JavaScript client side uh, script, you have the Firebase debug uh, JavaScript. So you can go, uh, if you're interested, you can go through uh, the whole uh, Firebase client <coughs> to understand how it works um, and, and really understand it deeply. Then there's one thing uh, we talked uh, yesterday about, it's offline support. They don't actually uh, have it right now uh, for the web, but it's coming soon. Uh, and they already have it on iOS, uh, and it makes app, re app development really uh, quick, uh, efficient. And I won't go again through all the benefits, but uh, it really makes a difference. And I think when they release it for the web, uh, it's, gonna be, um, it's gonna be huge, because once you've really synced thought about your app uh, in a real-time perspective and you, you have the architecture which works with real-time, uh, adding offline support is not difficult. Uh, so uh, for people who were convinced yesterday about offline, if you really uh, have already maybe a, an offline app, it's easy to make it real-time. Uh, at the same time, it really has uh, the, same, uh, the same background. So then they have integrations. Um, 
And one, one little thing again for people um, who are client-side developers and are interested in, in this backend as a service approach, they even provide uh, hosting, uh, but again, it's totally an option. Uh, you can just throw it if you want. So how does it work? Um, the basic is uh, you create a Firebase reference uh, to your Firebase location. Once you've got it, um, you just use set uh, to update. Um, with set, you pass uh, a JSON object, and it's very, um, it's, well, it, it's completely um, the usual thing. And then you can listen for, uh, for changes on this. Uh, so you have this on value, um, and you get uh, the data snapshot uh, every time something changes. You can also use once uh, it's provided. What you get is not directly uh, an object. Uh, it's a snapshot, as I call it. Um, you call um, the val method on it, and you get the real, uh, the, the real data. Uh, the reason for this is you have also a few other properties uh, on the snapshot, um, which, uh, for instance, help you with um, data order or things like this. Or you can also directly uh, call other methods uh, on the snapshot. So the usual, um, the usual um, demo, uh, the to-do, um, and what I'd like to pinpoint is there is no um, timer, there is no interval. Uh, it's really um, instant. Yeah, we're back, Bogan. Better. So it just works, uh, and um, what I'd like to, to show you now is how you do this with, uh, with, with Backbone and how you, you, you go uh, to migrate uh, from a static to, uh, to, to real time. And actually, it's just one line change. Um, you just uh, replace your existing, uh, your existing collection with a Backbone uh, Firebase collection, and it, it just gets, uh, it, it doesn't get more complicated than this. Uh, you provide the, the URL to your Firebase, and um, it, it, it just goes uh, real-time um, instantly. So one little thing is you, you, when you use a real-time collection, you need to keep um, backward models, standard backward models. You can't mix, um, or you don't have to mix, uh, real-time backbone models and uh, real-time collections. And the good thing is, you've, now you can just forget about uh, fetch or save, because uh, it doesn't make sense anymore. Well, as soon as you call uh, add or create, uh, it's automatically uh, persisted. Uh, it's, it automatically, it's, it's, the other thing is, it instantly triggers uh, locally, and then it persists to the server. So you can, as an option, uh, decide to wait for the server response to trigger locally. Uh, in some contexts, it makes sense. But otherwise, uh, it's um, instantly um, triggered for everything locally. So that's just uh, the way it works. You know, it doesn't change anything. You add, you remove, you create, and it just works. So another, uh, another quick example uh, to show you how simple it is, uh, is, for instance, to create a chat. As, as I said, it's, it's a very basic use case. Um, and it's actually just a collection uh, with a, a name and a message. What did I say? Oh, yeah. Who is? Oh, yeah, Adam. Cool. So you can also use um, Backbone Firebase model. Uh, this way, you just have a real-time model. It's useful for other kind of things. Um, actually, for instance, um, I, I, I was thinking about real simple things you can implement today. Um, I think user settings or user profiles are very useful uh, here. Uh, for instance, for your user settings, you can use the Backbone um, real-time model. Uh, what it means is when the user changes a setting, you directly get it on all the different windows open, for, in for instance, and you also directly get it um, on the different devices. So as I said about continuity, it's, uh, it's super useful uh, when people are using your app 
on different uh, on different platforms, different devices. So you can adopt your adapt your UI based on uh, on changes again, um, and you can do the same for user profiles. Uh, for instance, uh, your user changes um, his nickname. Uh, and it will automatically uh, change for every client connected. So when you're in your chat, for instance, uh, it's pretty nice. Um, as a matter of fact, you don't have to be writing the URL uh, all the time, like uh, what I put in the examples. Um, you can just call, um, use the ref, the Firebase reference, and pass it directly to your model. It also makes sense. Uh, and you can use this uh, child method uh, to access uh, the different childs. You can also put directly the slash uh, in it, like you, I could have done a ref child user settings slash user ID. Uh, you don't have to uh, go with uh, the child and child again and again. So to describe a bit more um, the Firebase API, you have um, a few simple things. The so first is a set, so it writes or replaces data uh, to a defined path. So it really um, takes your data and makes it persistent here. The update one, uh, it's, I think it's very simple. Uh, it just, uh, it just merges what you pass to, um, to, to the location. Push is a bit, uh, is a bit different. It actually automatically creates uh, client-side unique IDs. Um, so you don't need to, um, to, to take care of this. They do it instantly. And they make it um, in such a way that it's, your data is ordered. So as long as you, um, you use push, uh, when you retrieve your data later on, it will be ordered. Um, so you can use it uh, around with every client uh, connected, uh, and the data will always be in the right order. So that's uh, kind of a, a good assumption, and that's something they, they really provide to you, uh, and they make sure it works. You also, you also have a very nice feature. It's a bit more advanced, um, called the transaction. Uh, and it's, I think it's interesting to think about uh, client-side transactions like this. For instance, one use case for this um, is uh, you have some uh, badge with uh, the unread count of, uh, I don't know, the notifications or uh, messages with uh, this user. And um, you know, you may have several clients um, who want to update this at the same time. So a, a very bad way of doing it would be to take the value uh, add one and then set the value. That's not how you want to do it because if you have uh, several clients doing it at the same time, you will end up with um, messed up values. So the way you do it is you use a transaction. Um, the transaction basically, uh, the, 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 the function gets um, the current data as a parameter and you, you, just changes, uh, you, you can just change the data and return uh, the new data and Firebase takes care of making sure um, they've been using the latest current data to update it. The way it works is simply they, they send to the server uh, the current data and the new data, and they, they do it, uh, they will go back and forth until the current data is the right one. So it's very efficient, it works fine. And combining this with security rules, you can really make sure to have something that is both um, very uh, performant useful, um, it's only client side and it's still secure. Regarding how you retrieve data, so you have the, the, the on value uh, thing I showed earlier, you can also use a once value, which will only trigger once uh, as expected. You can also, so when you do it on a collection, uh, you do on value, what you get is a snapshot of the whole collection. Uh, then you can do a snapshot for each and go through it. The other way you can do it, which is a bit more um, getting into the real-time mindset, is you go with child added, child changed, child removed, child moved. Uh, all these things uh, are really um, collection oriented and, uh, and it really helps you uh, think no more as I get the snapshot of the data uh, at the data at some point, which doesn't really make sense actually um, for a real-time collection because um, you get the data and then it changes again and you will get all all the time the full block, which is not what you want. What you want to know is what are the new items what, which have been removed and so on. So using those uh, child added, child change and so on, you can really uh, get a good, uh, a good view of how it works. And if you go later on, um, check the source of the Backbone um, Firebase integration, it's actually what it does. It matches these events uh, with, um, with Backbone 
and uh, it really it really makes that easy. The question you may have is uh, then. That's fine. I have collection of models, but uh, for a real uh, application, a real life application, I need more. I need a way to query data. And you can do that. You can't do everything. Uh, you won't do like uh, uh, this string, this child contains uh, this string and so on. <coughs> That's not what, what it's intended to do. It may come at some point. They're adding and they're working uh, hard on this. In addition, um, they've been acquired by Google a few months back. <coughs> so it may help add more on this side. <coughs> so you can do complicated things with this. You can use um, order limits, start at, end at, and it really helps you to build uh, more complicated things. <coughs> you have uh, even guarantees. So Firebase makes important guarantees uh, regarding events. Events will always be triggered when local state changes. Events will always eventually reflect the correct state uh, of data, even in cases where local operations or timing cause temporary, temporary differences, you know, such as a temporary loss of network. So it's not completely offline. But if you get offline while the app is running, it keeps working. Does the local event keep uh, being triggered? And uh, as soon as it gets back online, it sinks. <coughs> Another little demo to show you that you, you can do fun things as well is play a Tetris. So I was playing with myself, which is not very interesting, I think. But it's, uh, it's pretty nice. <coughs> So to finish on, uh, on the API, you will also get uh, the connection status, uh, which can be useful to display to the user, uh, as we said with offline yesterday, the connection state, and to let them know if it's been persisted or not, which is, um, I think, more important right now as they don't have the offline support yet, because if, if it hasn't been synced and you leave the page, uh, it's just lost. And one very useful thing, uh, thing when you get uh, deeper into um, creating those full client-side apps is on disconnect. Because on disconnect uh, <coughs> is super important for uh, status. For instance, you have, uh, you know, so it's a user status, is he away, connected, or idle? And with it, you can make sure that if the client disconnects, the data is automatically removed, and you don't end up with um, some um, ghost or things like this. So security rules, this is just a quick uh, overview of what it is. You can get to that, it's, it's really nice. They also have added now um, a full language, which makes it easier to create um, more complex rules. <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay, so what are the challenges? Actually, um, you will instantly get working on a collection view, so Marionette may be very useful here. But there are some caveats, uh, especially with uh, the data order. The binding yet uh, doesn't really uh, help have the same order in uh, the backbone collection and um, and the, the real-time um, collection. So you need to write uh, the proper uh, comparator for your backbone collection. Then pagination. I guess with a real-time application, at first, you, you want to avoid it. But if you start having very large uh, data sets, you need to get back to this. And using start at, end at, and limit, you're able to build real-time pagination, uh, and it's quite, it's quite nice. A few issues come when you don't denormalize your data correctly, because you're loading by reference. Um, <coughs> and for instance, if you have a list of, um, um, one simple case is you are a user, 
you have a workspaces or projects. And at some location, you store uh, the list of projects of your user. But then when you plug backbone, uh, Backball real-time collection to this, it's not really perfect because what you get with the collection is only uh, uh, the names or the IDs of the projects. And you would like to get uh, more info at the same time. But for instance, the name of the project is not stored at this location, it's stored somewhere else. That's the kind of things with loading by reference, which it's not yet uh, super simple to do, but it doesn't get very complicated as well because you just plug another um, reference on value and you're able to update it um, differently. Then again, what it means is you have to focus on how you denormalize your data. And even though it's super cool for uh, client-side developers to be able to build all this without any um, server, um, you have to get interested in how you structure your data and you may not be used to it. Regarding offline, um, it's not yet on the web, but uh, a quick hint uh, for, um, for what's coming, as I've been working a lot on this uh, on iOS, is what you will hate is uh, once value. Because what does once mean uh, once you have data, or you have offline? You know, uh, it will automatically trigger with the offline value, but then it won't trigger again. So at some point, your user will have to refresh the page to get uh, the real data which has been retrieved by the server. And there will be always kind of a, uh, a delay because if you, don't retrieve the, if you don't reload the page, what you display is what the user got the last time he opened the page. So it may be a bit tricky. And if you really think about going uh, offline first, um, I, I would consider uh, using as, as least uh, these things as you can and try to get more into the on-value um, uh, way. Then another thing uh, Firebase is adding and releasing uh, soon uh, are triggers, uh, which really help you to go one step further, because up to now, you usually had to have some uh, Node.js uh, worker listening to some things to, for instance, uh, send an email when uh, some data changes, uh, you want to push notifications, uh, emails uh, with uh, information or things like this. And so it meant in the end you, you still needed some, uh, some node server. Um, I think what they, are, what they are creating now is a way in the security rules uh, to say if data changes at this location, I want to make a request uh, to this URL. Um, and, it, and you can integrate this, for instance, with Zapier or other services, which will enable you to have uh, direct actions without having to run uh, some uh, node server at the same time. So I don't know how familiar you are with, uh, with uh, denormalization. What it basically means is what I was talking a bit uh, about earlier, is you don't, you don't want to, push, to put all um, the data at the same place. Uh, it's not, uh, I have rooms. Uh, in the room, I have the names of the people. I have all the messages and so on. Because it, it will get tricky. At some point, uh, you will say, I just want to have the, um, uh, the room name of this. Or I just want to go through all the rooms. And your data set will get huge. And it won't be f possible for you to, to access one uh, direct child. Because what you need to keep in mind is you can't ask Firebase to provide you um, with this location and just uh, one level of children, for instance, and uh, not more. Uh, with the REST APIs are providing a bit of this now, um, but it's, it's never gonna, going to be, um, uh, to be real, because on the server side, they have to load the full node to, re to, to return you just uh, what you're asking for. So if your data set uh, becomes um, gigabytes, uh, eventually you'll just uh, get very slow. So that's not what you want. What you want is a bit more like this. Uh, you want a, a, a list of rooms uh, with a name and maybe the type. You want a list of members and for each room who is a member of this. And then you want a list of messages per room. Uh, this, will, uh, this will take some time, I think. Sometimes you think you've, get a, you've gotten better at this and, um, and then you realize, oh no, I should have done this again differently. So it's, it's, it's also about experience, but it's about thinking it uh, at the beginning and it's really a way, that's something you need to uh, kind of learn and be interested in it. So what's next? Um, 
I think regarding the denormalization, there is an interesting Firebase blog post uh, about denormalizing, denormalizing your data is normal. But you also have a few uh, very interesting Firebase uh, projects, uh, which are not all backbone related, but uh, give you uh, very interesting insights about what you can do uh, as very complicated projects sometimes um, with Firebase. For instance, Firepad, uh, I've been active uh, in the Firepad community, and it's, a, it's an open source operation transform based uh, collaborative text editor. So it provides a very, a very large feature set. Uh, many people use it, for instance, to create a collaborative uh, code editor. Uh, a lot of services of uh, code, um, peer coding or things like this have been written. Uh, it's, it's very simple, uh, but then it uses transactions in very smart ways uh, combined with uh, Operation Transform uh, to build complex apps which are purely client-side. It's not like Google Docs or, uh, uh, I don't remember, uh, Etherpad or things like this. Um, just about the talk coming is about um, geographical data. Uh, and that's interesting because Firebase, for instance, if you want to build a real-time app uh, where you can see the trucks moving in the city on a map or something like this, uh, you can do it with Firebase um, using these limits, uh, start at, end at. Uh, it's something you can do, uh, but it's a bit complicated, so they've created a library to do this. And then you have more, uh, very more uh, simple uh, basic examples uh, of apps like FireChat, which is a more complex um, example than I showed, and some of Office Space Organizer. That's it for me. Um, thank you again, and uh, thank you for uh, all the Boku team, uh, Adam and Clara, for um, bringing me here. Thanks.